So, uh, good morning and, and welcome to the second in our art series showcasing members of our parish with artistic skills and interests. Uh, today's conversation with Wilmar Jennings, who has kindly agreed to share his remembrances and knowledge of his parents' careers as artists, will be moderated by both myself and, and Ann Tate. Uh, that's not going to work, Ag, because you, you're, no, you're too close and, and, and you're, you've got to have your mask. Uh, uh, so, although I knew Mary Jennings, had, uh, Wilmar's mother, had belonged to the art, Providence Art Club, it was uh, really only earlier this year that when I was viewing the Stages of Freedom website that I learned about Wilmar Jennings, Wilmar's father, and maybe, maybe along the way we can hear, hear from Wilmar how he came to be Wilmar versus Wilmer. But anyway, uh, Wilmer was born and raised in segregated Atlanta, attending Booker T. Washington High School, the first high school for African-American youth built by the Atlanta Public Schools. After high school, he attended Morehouse College, a historically back, black college in Atlanta, where he majored in mathematics, studying art with Hal Woodruff at Atlantic University, I mean, excuse me, at Atlanta University. In 1935, he received a Rockefeller Scholarship and came north to Providence to study at the Rhode Island School of Design. Mary Howard, who would be his wife uh, in, in a few years, was born and raised here in Providence and attended Hope High School. And following high school, she attended the Rhode Island School of Design and then went on to Yale where she received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in 1935. So Wilmar, uh, could we begin by you telling us a bit about the African American art scene in Atlanta, how your father developed his arts interests and how he navigated segregated Atlanta, as well as his move north to Providence, all during the Depression. And then tell us how your mother developed her artistic interests and got to RISD and Yale, also during the Depression. So, <coughs> lead on. Okay, uh, my father, uh, fa his father's people were uh, in the building trades, and his mother's people were very much in uh, farming. Uh, and his mother was born, I think, uh, probably in Henry County or that, about 25 miles east of Atlanta. His father was born in Atlanta. Uh, he grew up, uh, because of his background, he had a lot of experience with, his, with buildings and also with the farm in the summer. Uh, he lived near Moore House, and I guess he assumed that that's where he would go. And it took him five years to get through because it was the Depression, and uh, they just didn't have much money. They lost a lot of their uh, property and such because of that. While he was at Morehouse, and he was already interested in art to begin with, he studied with Hale Woodruff. Woodruff came here in 1931 and was very much interested in uh, depicting the common people, the, the everyday person, the land, and so forth and so on. Uh, and I think that this was part of a more general movement in the country uh, you could see that in the uh, photography of uh, Dorothea Lang and Evans, Walker Evans, and uh, also the uh, painting of uh, Thomas Hart Denon and Grant Wood and so on. Uh, so if you look at this. Uh, his first prints here that, that are, have been published. The right one shows is black and white, it's a lino cut from 1931, and it's called The, Book, the Good Book Says. And it shows two uh, deacons working with a young woman and explaining to her what the book says. <laughs> and there are a lot of other people in the background 
and then off to the right is someone who appears to have fallen asleep or isn't paying attention. Uh, now on the left, there is a, uh, an oil painting done around the same time, possibly, I'm not sure which one was first, but that's a lot more complicated, but still, the, uh, the focus is on the two deacons and the woman who is uh, looking at the book. Off to the left, there is a fellow who is just like this, and it isn't clear who he is or what, why he's there. I think that that might have been a friend of my father that he stuck in there. And uh, there's an awful lot going on there, but I think that the black and white print shows the, the essence of what the situation is. Uh, <laughs> now this is at the end of the rope and it looks very luscious and so forth and so on, but if you look carefully, it's a head at the end of the rope, and I think that's a reference to lynching. Uh, that was done in 1935. Now, if you look at what my father was doing at that point, he finished his degree finally in 34. During the 34-35 academic year, he taught night school, and he also received money to do a, uh, a mural at Booker T. Washington High School. And he also worked with Hale Woodruff on other murals during that time. Uh, the following year, 35, 36, he received, through the recommendation of John Hope, who was president of Atlanta University, a fellowship to study at RISD uh, from Rockefeller. Uh, Rockefeller had set aside so many millions of dollars for various kinds of things, and this was a general education board fellowship. Uh, <clears throat> when he came to Providence, he roomed with a lady named Miss Anthony, uh, I think on Benefit Street, and <clears throat> he studied painting, printing, he became interested in metalworking and in jewelry for the first time. Uh, also during that year, he met my mother. Uh, he then went back to Atlanta and put in one more year uh, teaching math at Booker T. Washington High School. He decided that he didn't like teaching. Uh, and so he came back to Providence the following year and he and my mother got together, and they, share, they uh, at first they lived in a studio owned by uh, uh, Gordon Piers, another Rhode Island ar uh, artist, who was away that year. Uh, and when Piers came back and reclaimed his apartment, they moved to Rear 85 Benefit Street just up the hill from the Cathedral of St. John, the alley uh, that is uh, oh, north of uh, north of Church Street and south of, of Star Street. So, so Wilmar, during this time, this, this is a getting uh, towards the the WPA yes, it is. Works Progress yes. Administration uh, Federal Arts project, which yeah. I believe both of your parents were involved yes. in. And are some of the, the prints that are coming up uh, ones that, that uh, he did under the aegis of WPA? Yes. Yeah, uh, you can see here statuette, a uh, linoleum print, 1937. <clears throat> it shows an African statue in there uh, and some other items in the foreground, and the background is somewhat surrealistic. Uh, this is Boat Station, the Boat Station, 1938. Uh, that's the boat, a, his rendition of the Boat Station, which was a, um, <clears throat> where you took the New York boat, wherever that was, I guess it was in the Providence River, yeah. And, it turned out that when he submitted this for consideration, it was one of three prints in addition to four paintings that were 
shown at the New York World Fair in 1939 from Rhode Island. Hmm. That's pretty neat. Yeah. And this is Hilltop House, uh, 1939. <clears throat> uh, most of his work is um, imaginary. I'm not sure that this is a real house, and if you see at the bottom, there's a boat, uh, which shows the, the influence of being in Providence. Providence, of course, is a very much a tidewater city, whereas Atlanta is in the Piedmont section of Georgia. And uh, I think that the boat there shows the, the, the Providence influence. Uh, this was also shown in a 1946 exhibit, the, uh, the Negro Artist Comes of Age, I think, was the name of it. <clears throat> but it was done in 39. Yes, my father here in the plowman is uh, going back to his earlier roots in, in Georgia. It was done in 1945, and for a number of different reasons, it's probably one of his very best prints. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that characterizes his work is that it was not, his verticals were not vertical, his horizontals were not horizontal, but he changed, he tilted things sometimes, and that, I think that that makes it more, quote, artistic, unquote, as opposed to something that would be, <clears throat> yeah. So it, if I've got the timing right, uh, this was, he was, he was doing this, the, the, the works that you've just described during the war. Uh, he was working at, at the Kaiser Shipyard uh, uh, as a welder, and he had two little kids. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I should backtrack to the late 30s. <clears throat> he eventually got a job uh, as a costume jewelry designer and model maker for a small firm called H.A. Green, located on one of the steep streets that goes up the hill from Valley Street um, between, say, the Veterans Hospital and maybe Eagle Street, that general area. Uh, he worked for Green <clears throat> until, I guess, the world, the, the war got started, and he was able, he then went to the Walsh Kaiser shipyard at uh, Field Point and welded plates on the hulls of steel of, of ships and uh, became a foreman doing that. And all during that time, he also <clears throat> continued to make models, uh, do work for Green on the side, and also do his art. Uh, hmm. I was born, well, when they were living with my grandmother on, at Rear 85 Benefit, and for some strange reason, he spelled his name with an A on my birth certificate. Will Mar. <laughs> and it also, and at that time, they had what they call well baby clinics, <laughs> for, uh, where, where you could uh, take your child and get him weighed and his height checked and general health and so forth. Well, my father's name shows up as Wilmar there also, and that became my name. But on every other document, he spells his name with an E. And when I was baptized, Christmas Day of 1938 at the Church of the Savior, Father Moore Brown, knowing my father's name was Wilmer, uh, spelled my name with an E. So my baptismal name is Wilmer. <laughs> my, re my legal name is Wilmar. Uh, my parents took out an insurance in my name to Wilmar. Then they took out another insurance to Wilmer. And today, at, at Metropolitan Life Insurance then demutualized, so I have trust interests in the name of Wilmar and common stock in the name of Wilmer, and I haven't straightened it out yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's pretty funny. Um, then I had a, a, my, the older of my two sisters, Corrine, was born in 1942. Uh, <clears throat> we 
pronounced her name Corrine because she was named after my grandmother who spelled her name C-O-R-E-A-N, but my mother spelled Corrine, my sister, C-O-R-I-N-N-E, and sometimes C-O-R-I-N-E in two or three other, two other different ways. My just, mother just wasn't consistent in how she spelled names. <laughs> And that's created no end of problems for us. I imagine. I imagine. Yeah. Uh, well. So, uh, do we have some more of uh, his prints and uh, our, our okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. The harangue. Uh, the one on the right shows someone. Uh, this may actually date back to 42, but I'm not sure. Uh, someone's speaking about something on the street, and they're, most of them are listening, but a fellow at the bottom is lighting a cigarette. Um, <clears throat> my father and the people in the print appear to be European in background. Now, if you look in the painting on the left, my father is using the same composition, but to people of African descent, more people listening, and <clears throat> again, there's someone lighting a cigarette, and there are, they're holding two signs, all men are created equal, and so forth. But then you have the Ku Klux Klan coming down the street on the left. <clears throat> My father said, going back to, uh, the era in Georgia at that time, he said that if you didn't know someone who had been lynched, you knew someone who did know someone who had been lynched. It was a very difficult time there at that point. Uh, <clears throat> so we, my father is still bringing that into his work there as late as the 1940s. <clears throat> uh, and I might mention that well, I think his last prints were done in the late 40s, uh, 46, 47, 48. After that, he didn't do many prints. And, and now and then he did paintings, but he concentrated more on his jewelry work. And in 1948, he received, a, uh, he went to work for Imperial Pearl for more money. And, uh, spent the rest of his life until he died in 1990, uh, uh, working for Imperial Pearl. He also developed an interest in fine jewelry. Uh, uh, well, the drawings on the left show things that were typical of what he did for Imperial Pearl. But what you see on the right uh, appear to be fine uh, jewelry done with gold and uh, opals. And there's a ring, is there? Yeah, yeah the, the ring's, ring's next. Okay. Yep. That, that was my father's ring. It's a gold ring with a carved jade stone. Uh, I was told that it <coughs> was <coughs> uh, a scarab amulet similar to what the Egyptians had, but to me, it also looks like the face of a Mesoamerican culture from the Mesoamericans. It could be Toltec, Olmec, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I would need to go into to do the research to find out exactly what I think it is. I wish I had brought it with me, uh, but it's, I have it at home and I keep it in the safe deposit box most of the time. So, um, that's okay. Right, right. So, uh, while your father was uh, uh, at Imperial Pearl, your, your mother was, uh, again, working in the church, doing community stuff, Girl Scouts, uh, then went back to school and got her, uh, her teaching certificate and went on to teach in the Providence Public Schools at both Howland and Martin Luther King uh, Elementary Schools. Uh, I wanted to just uh, go back. Uh, yes, uh, I can talk about my mother, what she did. Yeah. 
yeah, for, uh, yeah I just wanted, I wanted to go back in time to, uh, to her, her WPA um, work. Uh, and maybe you can talk about, uh, about the, the, the painting of uh, Governor Green. Yes, <clears throat> going back again to uh, oh, 37, 38, my mother also a, uh, was a, uh, uh, worked with the WPA art project. And here you see a picture of Senator Green on the right talking to President Roosevelt. Is that, yes. Uh, my mother did a painting of Theodore Francis Green uh, <clears throat> that was in the library at URI in 1962 when my sister and I took French lessons. And I don't know if it's still there or not. I haven't been to URI since, so <laughs> I don't know. Uh, she also submitted a, a, a three paintings to a uh, an, exhib an exhibition of Negro artists at Dillard University in uh, 1939 and got an art, received a first honorable mention. And Hale Woodruff also had a painting in the same exhibition and didn't get an award. <laughs> so my mother's work was considered reasonably good enough to get an award there, uh, but she became a house, a, a housewife she became responsible for running the house. She had to deal with me, my sister, uh, and uh, then we had a third child, a third uh, sibling, Laurel, born in 1948. And if you thought that I, my sister and my older sister, the younger, the, the, well, Corrine and I were bad, Laurel just cried and she just uh, not, lowered the standards for everything. <laughs> I, I'm not even going to go into Laurel. Uh, anyway, my parents had to deal with all three of us. And <clears throat> so my mother didn't really do very much art again uh, until later. Uh, what are the, she became interested in, the, in community affairs and she was the recording secretary for the Episcopal Diocese's uh, uh, Women's Auxiliary to the National Council for two or three years. And then she was with the Providence Girl Scout Council. And I remember her talking about a Mrs. Mandeville and she said that Mrs. Mandeville was like a general. <laughs> but eventually she, went, she decided to go back to school practice teach, and she ended up teaching third grade, not art. And she earned a, uh, a Master of Education in 1969 at Rhode Island College with a specialization in reading. When she re finally retired in 1976, I guess, she became an interested in art again. She <clears throat> uh, joined the Providence Art Club, the Rhode Island Watercolor Society, uh, the Whitford Art Association, uh, <clears throat> and this shows one of her paintings, her watercolors, which she did. I'm not sure where, but she gave it to me and told me that she wanted me to have it. And then there's also one uh, that. Yeah, that 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 that's the one that that uh, Dan uh, was either given or bought. Okay, and then there's another one for the Wickford Town Beach. Yes, please do. Uh, I, I, so, uh, and your mother was uh, 
quite long-lived, living to 102, which is uh, pretty remarkable. Yeah. Um, I think in, in, in summary, to me, both of your parents were remarkable people who uh, came of age, if you will, in, in a difficult time during the Depression uh, because of their uh, race, ethnicity, uh, undoubtedly did not have an, an easy time both in their education as well as uh, their avocations and, and lives in general, uh, and yet they succeeded and uh, gave an enormous uh, amount to, to us, uh, the, us in, 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 in the greater neighborhood sense, uh, per Julie's uh, uh, sermon. Um, so is, is there anything, you know, final that, that you'd like to, to uh, reflect on, Wilmar, uh, before we entertain questions from, uh, from I, the audience? I just wanted to point out the picture that my mother did at the, uh, of the North Kings downtown beach. She was looking out towards a point of land, and there's a house there at the end, and Jamestown is off to the left in the distance. Uh, I was with her when she did that. I tried to paint the same scene, and I liked her so much better than mine that I didn't keep mine. <laughs> uh, there's a large rock, this uh, boulder that sits out into the water that she didn't paint, but I don't think that she needed it. Uh, and the painting that she did has a fair amount of pink in it that you don't show, but that's probably good because there wasn't pink there that I could see. My mother decided to put in the pink, and I think that it makes it a better painting. But it was not a pink sky that day. Uh, that's what I'll say about that. Uh, <clears throat> I will say that my parents seemed to do what they wanted to do. Uh, and um, I think in the long run, they did fairly well. And they provided a, I know that I depended a lot on the, I thought I was independent, of course, that I could do everything on my own and so forth and so on. But they helped me now and then, even when I didn't think I needed it, they helped. Good parents. Yeah, I think they were in the long run. I had my differences, of course, with them. and and. Uh, <clears throat> when I would come to visit, at first they listened to what I had to say, and my father would spend about a half an hour listening, then he went upstairs. And everything was nice for about three days, but then they would start picking on me, and I would answer back, and every, when, everything went back to normal. I call that the three-day rule. <laughs> yeah. And that picture of my mother that you showed was uh, taken when she was in her 80s. Yeah, are there questions? Uh, that yeah. Uh, 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 Julie has a question. with it in a way. And when I went back, see, looking at my own career, I decided to study experimental psychology. And I taught for eight years doing that, and I published some work on the behavior of rats in various situations. And I won't go into that. But I decided to go back to school and study architecture in 1974 while I, at the University of New Mexico, and I took classes in art. And uh, beginners painting, drawing, metal working. Uh, and then when I worked, went to work in Alaska for the Corps of Engineers in the late 80s, I again took drawing one, painting one, and printmaking. So I, I have done a little of that off and on. And, uh, but I haven't done, I think I did more in the late 80s and early 90s and, and later. Oh, I have.
have it at home. So do you, do you think you were, you're, uh, well, this is probably, this is an unfair question, but uh, uh, did you, did you feel that you, you lived up to your parents' standards as an artist or, or, uh, I mean, is that why you sort of hadn't pursued suit it or? Well, <clears throat> I showed my father some of the things I had done, and he said, well, I like this. Uh, oh, that's interesting. And my mother said that I should, <clears throat> I tend to be, uh, my verticals are vertical, my horizontals are horizontal, <laughs> and, I, I, and I like drawing better than painting. Mm -hmm. uh, I could not possibly tilt things the way my father did, and I can't, couldn't possibly put in all the color that my mother did. Whatever my thing is, that's not what they were doing. Right. Uh, and I haven't really discovered what it is that I would like to show at this point in my life. So maybe I should try something while I still have uh, a, 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 a time left to do it. Okay. Uh, most of the work that we have been showing what ha is his uh, linoleum prints and wood blocks, yeah, wood, wood engraving. He also did some mezzotints and uh, oh, uh, etchings, and <clears throat> he also had a uh, oh some of his early work was done using uh, oh, the kind of printing that you do with a large stone. Uh, lithography. lithography, yes. But he didn't do, do much with that. Uh, I think of all of the types, I personally prefer linoleum, but I could also work with wood, I think. Uh, but then I have my arthritis in my hands now to deal with, too, so. Yes. And, and do you have some, some final thoughts? Or? Yeah, I might mention that my sister, Kareem, <clears throat> uh, in New York in 1990, after my father died, established, she already had one gallery, the Kenkeleba Gallery, on one side of East 2nd Street, but she established a second one, which is actually more convenient to get into, and, and called the Wilmer Jennings Gallery in memory of my father. So, and she continues to do that. Here's my sister right there. Oh, is she tuned tune in today? No, I guess not. Uh, we didn't, we didn't know, we wanted, we wasn't a long time, but like, you have a whole, you could do a whole show on your phone. Yeah. Uh, we wanted to, uh, just touch on. Yeah, what you're seeing there is Ken Caliba. <clears throat> They're on the, they have the, oh, a large gallery on the first floor, then there's a, uh, actually, they live on the second floor, but there's a, uh, and that's where they have their gallery. And, a, and at one time it was a uh, <clears throat> owned by the uh, oh something like the military uh, um, the the Nash, the I don't know what it is. But there's a very large room with a balcony and so on uh, where they used to have dances and such. Yeah, and they were able to get the property very cheaply in the early 80s because many of the buildings in the neighborhood were abandoned. It was just uh, 
drug dealers in the buildings with people running in and out and people selling drugs on the, in the, in the uh, neighborhood and so on. But that has gradually improved over the years. And uh, there's a building across the street where they have the Wilbur Jennings Gallery, but that's where Ken Caliban is. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, Wilmar, for sharing. Oops, got one more, one more comment. Yeah, and that uh, the currency of meeting is there something that they had recently? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Al Loving is one of the people in, in that. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions from the people out there? Questions, then thank you all, uh, uh, all, all the Zoomers for, for joining us here in the church. Wilmar, thank you. And a big, huge thank you to you for putting together the show. And thanks to the rest of the audience. Okay. And okay, I just want to say one thing more. We need to get into Thanksgiving baskets. <laughs> 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 Got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much.